The many paths and trails cutting through the Scottish Highlands have served as the nation's lifeblood for hundreds of years, enabling the rapid flow of people, cattle and goods through some of the most rugged terrain the country has to offer. Until the building of the military road network in the 18th century, the Highlands remained a largely wild and unconquered land. The introduction of these strategic roads marked not just a shift in transportation, but a profound transformation of the Highland landscape and culture, paving the way for increased accessibility, commerce and control. As the once untamed land yielded to the ordered structure of roads, it brought forth an era of change, bringing opportunity and challenges to the inhabitants of this resilient and historic region. Many of the ageing roads and pathways were forgotten and soon faded from memory, gradually succumbing to the relentless embrace of nature. As time marched on, the stories of those who once tread these routes vanished into obscurity, their stories swallowed by the inexorable passage of time. The once vibrant tales of the people who journeyed along these forgotten roads now exist only as faint echoes. Not all ancient trackways have faded into obscurity. Some have experienced a rejuvenation, finding new purpose amid the surge in outdoor activities during the latter half of the 20th century. Among these revitalised paths, the West Highland Way stands out as perhaps the most renowned. Stretching nearly 100 miles through stunning landscapes, this iconic trail that opened in 1980 not only immerses outdoor enthusiasts in the breathtaking beauty of the Scottish countryside, but also guides them through layers of rich history. Connecting the town of Mulgai, just outside Glasgow, with Fort William, the route encompasses ancient drovers and military roads, providing a tangible link to the past. Tens of thousands of people annually traverse these paths, walking through history and rugged beauty. Yet beneath the scenic allure and historical echoes, there lies an additional layer of mystery. Unbeknown to many walkers, the West Highland Way is not only rich and natural in historical narratives, but also shrouded in haunted tales and ghostly legends. Each step becomes a journey, not only through time and terrain, but also through the ethereal where the spirits of the past may linger in the shadows of Scotland's rugged beauty. The route starts off on the outskirts of Glasgow, in the eastern Bartonshire town of Mulgai. As you progress, you leave suburbia behind and transition into a more rural setting. The path winds through lush woodlands, open fields and rolling hills, providing glimpses of the serene countryside and teasing the natural wonders to come. Soon you'll find yourself in the wonderful Mugduck Park, Mugduck Park is a sprawling and picturesque country park, offering a harmonious blend of woodlands, meadows and historic features such as the ruined Mugduck Castle, once the stronghold of the Graham clan. In the shadows of the modern visitor centre that now dominates the landscape, Gallow Hill sits quietly, relying a far darker history than the welcoming facade of the contemporary hub might suggest. Not far from the centre, where families come to learn and children play games in the thick woodland lies a poignant reminder of the past, the Drowning Pond. The pond stands as a haunting juxtaposition against the modern tourism scene, a solemn ground where witches were once tragically drowned. In the turbulent era of mid-17th century Scotland, the judicial penalties imposed on convicted criminals were notoriously severe. Confessions, often coerced through the use of brutal torture instruments, were a grim testament to the harsh justice of the time. While men faced the gallows, women met a grisly fate in the chilling waters of the pond, as drowning stood as the traditional punishment for females. Additionally, those found guilty of arson were subjected to the same watery sentence. The original small drowning pool underwent a transformation around 1816, evolving into a significantly larger lily pond, but the haunting echoes of its dark history lingered beneath the serene surface. In the years that have unfolded since the last tragic drowning, 
Those who visit or pass by the pond have shared unsettling stories of ghostly moans and wails. These eerie sounds seem to linger among the trees and even emanate from beneath the water's surface. Such chilling echoes resonate across time and serve as haunting reminders of the unfortunate souls who met their end in the icy waters of the drowning pond. As we leave Mugduk Park, we head towards the small village of Drimmon. The trail winds through open fields and wooded areas, offering occasional glimpses of the Campsie Fells on the horizon. The scenery transitions from gentle slopes to more rugged terrain, providing a mix of pastoral beauty and natural ruggedness. For those walking the West Highland Way, Drimmon serves as a practical stopover with necessary amenities. The village offers accommodation options, pubs and shops for restocking supplies. Its straightforward layout and friendly atmosphere cater to the needs of weary hikers, providing a solid base to refuel and prepare for the next leg of the journey. Drimmon is surrounded by greenery and its proximity to the picturesque Loch Lomond adds a tranquil touch to the overall setting. It's also only a few miles walk from the ruined Buchanan Castle. Buchanan Castle is an historic estate with a fascinating history. The castle was originally built in the 1850s by the Duke of Montrose as a family residence, showcasing a distinctive Scottish baronial architectural style. Over the years, the castle evolved to serve various purposes, including use as a military hospital during World War II where Nazi politician Rudolf Hess was treated after crashing his plane in his attempt to barter a peace deal with the British authorities. Sadly, in 1954, to avoid paying tax on the property, the roof was removed and the castle fell into ruin. Despite its damaged state, the site remained significant and the surrounding grounds were later developed into a golf course. Today, the remains of Buchanan Castle stand as poignant ruins amid scenic landscapes, offering a glimpse into the past and serving as a unique feature within the modern golf course setting. In the years since, many curious visitors have come to the site to take in the atmospheric ruins, now overgrown with ivy. In the last few years, it's taken on a new lease of life as a haven for urban explorers who visit to explore its haunting ruins and document what they see. But some leave with experiences they never intend to have. Often the sound of whispering is heard emanating from the ruins of this once noble house, as if life still carries on within its dilapidated walls. Ghostly echoes of what seem to be long forgotten dinner parties have been reported, suspended in the atmosphere among the shattered remnants of the castle. This begs the question, could the ethereal presence of the short-lived castle's inhabitants still linger within the grounds of Buchanan Castle? Your next destination unfolds along the bonny bonny banks of Loch Lomond, Britain's largest body of water that marks the boundary between the lowlands and the highlands. The best places to stay here can be found between the charming village of Balmaha and the picturesque Rower Denon, situated near the foot of Ben Lomond, Scotland's most southerly Munro. The trail gracefully winds along the loch's banks, providing expansive views of its tranquil waters and the surrounding hills. This waterside journey crafts a serene environment, enriched by glimpses of the loch, enhancing the overall walking experience on this iconic trail. And if luck is on your side, you may catch a glimpse of the rarely seen Loch Lomond monster. When you think of Loch monsters, Loch Ness and Loch Morar naturally steal the limelight. Yet down south, Loch Lomond has its own tales to tell. Although it has to be said, encounters are a rarity. The few who've witnessed the enigmatic creature describe scenes that linger in the mind. In the 19th century, a lone fisherman, quietly minding his own business, was jolted by the sight of a sinuous neck rising from the water, an eerie semblance to a prehistoric plesiosaur. 
a more recent account introduced a touch of the exotic, with the flabbergasted witnesses describing a creature similar to a large saltwater crocodile. Is it just possible that in the shadowy depths of Britain's largest body of water, the sporadic glimpses of the mysterious Loch Lomond monster suggest that a well-concealed secret might be lurking beneath the tranquil surface, only revealing itself on the rarest of occasions. The upcoming stretch of the trail proves to be a formidable challenge for many, emerging as possibly the most demanding segment. While still tracing the shores of the loch, the path undergoes a transformation, narrowing considerably. Negotiating this terrain demands height and concentration, as hikers traverse numerous obstacles, navigating over the intricate network of tree roots and rocky terrain. This historically rich and breathtaking section holds a significant place in the past, frequented by the notorious 18th century outlaw Rob Roy MacGregor. The very air seems to carry whispers of legends intertwined with the stretch, adding an extra layer of fascination to an already picturesque landscape. Roy fought in the Jacobite Rebellion, which hoped to bring a Stuart to the throne, and was injured in the Battle of Loch Shiel in 1719. Later he became a cattleman, but was evicted from his home in Inversnaid when he was left penniless after a cattle deal went wrong. His lands were seized by the Duke of Montrose, with whom he fought a bloody feud before finally being caught and imprisoned. A fictionalised book, The Highland Rogue, was written about him and popularised his story. The popularity of the book led to his pardon and release from prison. He was further popularised when Sir Walter Scott wrote Rob Roy in 1817. Towards the end of the loch, you'll come across a site called Rob Roy's Cave. This spot served as a refuge for Roy during legal troubles and also doubled as a makeshift prison. Perhaps the most famous incident associated with the cave, Roy detained the Sheriff of Dumbartonshire here for a week. Leaving the lock, our next stop is the Drover's Inn. Arguably the most haunted location along the way. The Drover's Inn, an old coaching inn, is an historic establishment utilised by Highland Drovers who once herded their cattle alongside Loch Lomond en route to the markets. Established in 1705, the inn has witnessed a diverse array of individuals, from nobles and drovers to Jacobites, redcoats and outlaws, all contributing to the rich history of this venerable establishment. The inn has remained largely unchanged over the years, and stepping through its doors might make you feel as though you ventured into a different era, a testament to its enduring charm and historical resonance. Your initial realisation that the Drovers is unlike any other place begins the moment you're greeted by a stuffed grizzly bear upon entering. It's not just the bear, the entire place is adorned with a collection of stuffed animals, lining the halls and walls, creating a distinctive atmosphere throughout. While your eyes might be captivated by the array of stuffed animals, your senses could also be detecting something unseen, something far more frightening. Should you brave a night in the Drovers, there are perhaps a couple of rooms you may want to avoid, or ask to book, depending on how courageous you feel. These are room two and room six. In 1792, during the Highland Clearances, a family faced eviction from their croft as their landlord sought greater profits through sheep farming. Homeless and with scant resources for their young child, the family headed south, aspiring to carve out a new life in the Scottish lowlands, or perhaps even start afresh in the new worlds. During their lengthy winter journey south, they found themselves caught in a fierce snowstorm one night, aiming to find refuge at the Drover's Inn. However, hampered by poor visibility and fatigued from their journey, they veered off course. Tragically, as they wandered the land, desperately trying to retrace their steps to the Drovers, the winter conditions proved too much and they were lost in the snow. Over the years, numerous accounts have emerged of people witnessing the family during winter, searching for shelter. 
On several occasions, they've even seemed to reach their destination from that dreadful night. One report tells of a couple staying recently in room two at the Drovers, who awoke in the night, chilled to the bone. To their surprise, the young family stood shivering at the foot of their beds, visible breath in the now freezing air. The young boy waved, expressing a sense of joy at seemingly finding what they were desperately searching for, shelter. A guest who stayed in the inn one October reported the haunting encounter in room 6. This encounter is taken from the Drovers Inn website. On the night of Friday the 21st of October, my girlfriend and I made a stop off at the Drovers on our way up to the Isle of Mull. I've stayed at the Drovers many times, but it was a first for my girlfriend. She loved the place by the way. We stayed in room 6, and after having a bite to eat in the bar, we retired to our room for the night. At some stage, in the middle of the night, my girlfriend woke up and asked me if I could see a flickering light moving around the room. Still half asleep, I told her she must be looking at the flashing light in the smoke detector. She asked me to look again, which I did. To my surprise, there were numerous tiny white points of light dancing around in mid-air. At any one time I would estimate that we could see between 10 and 20 of the lights. Although very small, the white lights were very intense. They seemed to move randomly, appearing and then disappearing. The room was pitch black with no other light source which could have been reflecting to cause what we saw. We both watched the lights for a long time, unable to explain what was causing them. Were the lights observed in room 6 a result of natural or electrical phenomena? Or did the couple witness spiritual lights that October night? More than three centuries ago, during the time when cattle drovers made frequent stops at the inn on their journey south to the cattle markets, a particular young drover named Angus took respite for the night. Exhausted after a long trek from the Highlands, Angus appreciated the famous Highland hospitality a wee bit too much. Unfortunately, he overslept the next day, only to discover that rival clan members, aware of his indulgence the night before, had made off with his cattle under the cover of darkness. Left with neither cattle nor the expected payment, Angus had no choice but to return to the Highland chieftain he was delivering the cattle for and explain his misfortune. The ruthless chieftain, upon hearing the news, retaliated by mercilessly slaughtering Angus's family and young sweetheart, subsequently banishing Angus from the clan in disgrace. Heartbroken and with nowhere to go, Angus wandered the highlands for months, plotting his revenge against the rival clan members who'd stolen his cattle. Eventually, consumed by rage, he returned to the drovers, the site of the original crime. Concealing himself, Angus awaited the opportune moment to exact revenge. However, a member of the rival clan had spotted Angus and alerted his clansmen to his presence. In the cold of the night, they ambushed him, murdering him mercilessly by hanging him from the old tree behind the inn and bleeding him, mirroring the fate of the stolen cattle. Throughout the years, numerous accounts have surfaced of people claiming to see and hear Angus wandering through the drovers late at night, his anguished screams echoing as he searches for the thieves to fulfil his quest for revenge. The Drovers is also said to be sadly haunted by the spirits of children. Several years ago, a woman who'd stayed at the inn with her family reached out about a week after their visit. She claimed to have captured what she believed to be the image of a young girl wearing a pink dress and a family photo taken inside the inn. The girl was as clear as day and as tangible as the others in the picture, but there was something off about her, something the guest couldn't quite put her finger on, something out of place. Convinced that no such girl was present when the photo was taken, she contacted the inn staff in an effort to satisfy her curiosity. However, the answer provided only deepened the intrigue. There had been no children staying at the inn during her visit. Did the photographer inadvertently capture the image of a ghostly girl in a pink dress? Or was it simply a case of misremembering an accidental photobomb? 
In the 18th century, a young girl who'd been playing on the banks of the River Falloch slipped and tragically drowned in the freezing water of the river. On discovery of the wee girl's body, she was brought into the inn and laid to rest on a bed in room six. In the years that have passed since that tragic incident, numerous guests who have slept in room six claim to have been abruptly awakened in the dead of night, sensing the presence of a small, icy cold and wet body beside them. The journey from the Drovers Inn to Crane Larrack offers a picturesque and varied experience for walkers. As you set off, the trail meanders through lush woodlands, providing a refreshing start to the trek. The terrain varies from well-maintained paths to natural tracks, offering a mix of easy strolling and slightly more challenging sections. Approaching Crane Larrack, the landscape opens up, revealing expansive views of the surrounding mountains. The tranquil ambience and natural beauty make this stretch of the West Island Way a memorable and enjoyable part of the journey. However, this tranquil beauty hides a tragic story. The following account was sent to Country Life magazine by an anonymous woman from Surrey who visited the area in 1942. In Scotland last year, while walking through an ancient forest with my husband, we took a shortcut through the Wild Glen and intended to walk down to the bank of the Fillin to Crane Larrack. We came to an open space, flat and treeless and full of sun haze. As we entered, my husband remarked, I don't like this place, it's too old and dead. I was about to reply that to me it felt only peaceful, but I suddenly had the sensation of depression, almost amounting to hopelessness. What I saw was more of a feeling, as if all about me was snow under a leaden sky, and behind me there were people, and their eyes were without hope. My husband saw that I was oddly frightened, and so we left for Crane Larrick. We told them at the hotel that we'd felt spooky at one place in the forest. The late Mr Alistair Stewart said, Oh yes, that would be where the whole village was lost in the snow, and they all starved to death. We're both Celtic, but neither of us in the least bit psychic. One thing I do know is that even if I were chased by Hitler and his grisly gang, I wouldn't enter that forest again. When you visit this stunning area, take a moment to reflect on the hidden stories beneath the serene landscapes and explore the haunting tales that echo through the ancient forests and sunlit glens. Our next section, possibly the most picturesque on the route, takes us over Rannoch Moor and to the ominously named Devil's Staircase. Departing from Crane Larrick, the trail initially leads through well-maintained paths, guiding hikers amid picturesque woodlands, barren moorland and gently undulating landscapes. The scenery gradually transforms, revealing expansive vistas of the surrounding mountains, before eventually arriving at the foot of the Devil's Staircase. Built in the 18th century as part of the military road network, the purpose of the Devil's Staircase was to facilitate easier movement of troops and equipment through the challenging terrain of the Highlands. Constructed under the supervision of General Caulfield, the road aimed to assert control over the Highlands after the Jacobite uprisings. The staircase earned its name due to the strenuous task of hauling construction materials up this challenging incline. The moniker endured when labourers, having received their wages, opted for a journey to the nearest pub after their toils in constructing the Blackwater Dam. For those working in Kinloch Leven, the trek to the King's House Hotel turned out to be more arduous than anticipated, and the return journey, particularly on a frosty winter night, proved perilous. With already unsteady legs, many struggled to make their way back, and in the chill of a winter's night, the devil often claimed his own. In the late 1960s, an estate worker was making his way home over the devil's staircase, accompanied by his trusty Highland Garan pony after a hill expedition. As darkness set in, his family grew concerned about his absence, especially as they'd noted that he'd left his torch behind. Worried that something may have happened, they decided to ascend the Devil's Staircase. 
The night was eerily silent until the distant sound of the pony's shoes striking the path stones reached their ears. Simultaneously, they observed a moving light in the distance, seemingly following the same zigzagging path down the hillside. Relieved that the pair were finally homeward bound, the family assumed he had taken a torch after all and returned to await their arrival. When the familiar footsteps reached their ears, the family impatiently went out to welcome the tired travellers. Inquiring about the torch, the estate worker replied, I had no light. I was letting the sure-footed pony lead me home. This answer left the family puzzled. They had distinctly witnessed the light zigzagging along the path, synchronised with the pony's footsteps. With no other encounters on the hill that late night, the mystery lingered, leaving the possibility of another kind of presence unexplained. Did the estate worker see the spirits of those who'd been claimed by the Devil's Staircase? Continuing from the challenging Devil's Staircase, the path offers an expansive view as you approach Kinloch Leven. The impressive mamores dominate the horizon, and the trail winds through varied landscapes, showcasing the surrounding peaks. Kinloch Leven, tucked away at the east end of tranquil Loch Leven, seamlessly blends its industrial past with the burgeoning embrace of tourism. The village unfolds a rich narrative, where remnants of its industrial heritage stand alongside the appeal of a destination that beckons to visitors seeking both history and scenic allure. The more courageous walker may choose to stay a few miles outside Kinloch Leven, at the historic Balahulish House. The present day house has its origins in the latter part of the 18th century, emerging from the aftermath of the destruction of its precursor in 1746. Constructed around 1764, the building's core was expanded with a front range in approximately 1800 and later underwent alterations, including the demolition of one wing in 1872. Although it's experienced a period as a hotel during renovations in the 1990s, the property has since reverted to being a private residence, with a Bothy house available for hire. Should you have the chance to stay there, you may experience more than just the famous Highland hospitality. The house was at one point occupied by the family of Sir Harold Bolton, famed for writing the lyrics to the Sky Boat Song. Before Sir Harold moved in, he'd become aware of a fascinating story related to the house. His mother would often tell him of incredibly vivid dreams she'd have, where she'd visit a remote Highland property. In these dreams, she'd wander through the house, becoming acquainted with every nook and cranny, and every rock and every tree in the gardens. A few years passed and the Boltons visited the house with a view to buying. At this time the property was owned by a lady Beresford. Mrs Bolton, now in her later years, felt an immediate sense of familiarity upon entering the house, as if she'd walked its halls in another time. The deeper she delved into its spaces, the more convinced she became that she had, at some point, spent considerable time within its walls. Intriguingly, Lady Beresford shared a remarkable tale about Balahulish House, recounting instances where the spirit of a woman bearing a striking resemblance to Mrs Bolton in her younger years had visited the premises on multiple occasions. Mrs Bolton's living ghost isn't the only haunting associated with the house. Owners of the property have witnessed the sight of a spectral horseman charging up the driveway on a mighty horse before dismounting and vanishing. A small, scruffily dressed man has also been seen shuffling around near the gate that leads to this incredibly haunted house. Our final section takes us into Fort William, the outdoor capital of the UK. Departing Kinloch Leven, the trail ascends swiftly, tracing the path of the Larrick Moor a substantial mountain pass nestled between the towering peaks of Ben Nevis and the Mamores. This remote and rugged terrain unfolds into a broad glen 
surrounded by majestic summits, forming a breathtaking and historic corridor for those journeying along the West Highland Way. Here you'll see Scotland at its finest, with the echoes of the past hidden among the natural beauty of the Nevis Range. Along this route, you'll find an ancient cairn commemorating a battle in 1645 between the Macdonalds and the Campbells. Depending on your clan allegiance, the legend goes that you add or take away from the cairn. If you're a Macdonald, you add, a Campbell, you take. After a couple of hours, you begin the final stretch of the walk when you enter Glen Nevis, passing the vitrified hill fort of Dundairdal. Constructed by the Celts in around 100 BC to 100 AD, Dundairdal stands as the remnants of a fort fortified through the unique process of vitrification, wherein the builders fused rocks together by melting them, creating exceptionally strong fortifications. Leaving this wonder behind, you descend the glen into Fort William, where our walking journey ends. But our spectral journey has one final stop, Old Inverlochy Castle. Old Inverlochy Castle is a medieval fortress built in the 13th century. It served as a strategic stronghold in various conflicts throughout Scottish history, witnessing battles and sieges, and of course, it's haunted. Within the walls of the ancient castle, a haunting aura pervades, whispered to be not only haunted by the lingering spirits of past governors, but also by the tormented souls of those lost in the brutal battles that once engulfed its environs. The spectral presence of former owners is said to manifest in ghostly apparitions, perhaps guardians of their historic domain. Yet, it's the ethereal remnants of the fallen, casualties of conflicts etched into the very stones, whose phantom echoes are said to reverberate through the castle's chambers. Visitors speak of chilling encounters, moments when the veil between the living and departed seems to thin, capturing the essence of a tumultuous past that refuses to be forgotten. The haunting legacy of old Inverlochy Castle unfolds as a spectral tapestry, weaving together the fates of those who once called it home and those who met a tragic end within its formidable walls. We've now come to the end of our journey along the West Highland Way. I hope you've enjoyed the ghostly tales and mysteries that shroud this incredible landscape. I've walked the route many times, and each time I've fallen in love with it more. The history, the mountains, the locks, and the people all make this a must for outdoor and history enthusiasts. The section between Kinloch Leven and Fort William is a personal favourite. To my mind, here is where you'll experience Scotland at its finest. I've stayed in the Drovers on a few occasions, and while I've never witnessed any of the spirits spoken of earlier, I did spend a very uneasy night there in 2013. The room I was in, modern and comfortable, had an aura to it that left me feeling like I wasn't alone. Because of this, I struggled to sleep and ended up with the light on and a radio playing for company. I was very glad to leave in the morning, but in all honesty, I'm dying to go back. Undoubtedly, the West Highland Way is a route haunted by the lingering spirits of days gone by. Whether these are the ethereal remnants of history's denizens or the echoes of forgotten whispers, the mystique of this land persists, weaving tales that echo across the vast Scottish landscape. Should you ever have the opportunity to walk this trail, take a moment to revel in the natural splendour, allowing the elegance of the surroundings to captivate your senses. As you navigate through the breathtaking landscapes, Consider the historical narrative woven by the people who, in years past, traversed these very paths, and let their stories resonate with every step you take.